My topic is Afghanistan. Today I want to talk to you about how and why the United States has, in my view, become trapped in an endless cycle of drugs and death in Afghanistan, a Sisyphean cycle from which there is no easy end nor obvious exit. Let me begin this talk with an anecdote plucked from the front pages of your daily newspaper. After a year of cautious debate and costly deployments, President Obama finally launched his new Afghan war strategy at 2.40 a.m. on February 13th of this year in a remote Afghan market town called Marja. As a wave of U.S. helicopters descended into Marja's outskirts, spitting up clouds of dust, hundreds of U.S. Marines dashed through fields, sprouting opium poppies towards the town's mud wall compounds. After a week of fighting finally expelled the Taliban guerrillas, U.S. Afghan Commander General Stanley A. McChrystal choppered into town with Afghanistan's Vice President and the Provincial Governor of Helmand in tow. Their mission, a media rollout for the General's new look counterinsurgency strategy based on bringing government to the people in remote villages just like Marja. But at a carefully staged meet and greet with some 200 villagers, the Vice President and Provincial Governor met some unexpected, unscripted local anger. If they come with tractors, one Afghani widow, widow announced to a chorus, a chorus of supportive shouts, they will have to roll over me and kill me before they can kill my poppy. For these farmers and thousands more just like them, government control had brought the very real threat of opium eradication. Throughout all this shooting and shouting, American commanders seemed somehow oblivious to the fact that Marja was arguably the world's heroin capital. With hundreds of heroin laboratories hidden inside these mud brick houses and the surrounding fields of Helmand province producing a remarkable 40% of the world's illicit opium supply. As one U.S. Embassy official, just back from expecting the opium districts of Helmand, said to me in a recent phone call, quote, you can't win this war without taking on drug production in Helmand province. Just as these Marja farmers spoiled General McChrystal's media event, so their drug harvest has subverted every regime that has tried to rule Afghanistan for the past 30 years. During the Cold War decade of the 1980s, the CIA provided the guns and opiums to finance a guerrilla war that drove the Soviets out of Afghanistan and destroyed their Marxist client regime. In the 1990s, the Taliban's government lost international legitimacy by taxing opium and then fell from power only months after banning the crop. Since the U.S. military intervened in Afghanistan in 2001, a rising opium harvest has corrupted the legal government in Kabul and empowered a resurgence of Taliban guerrillas in the countryside. Through their endless violence, these three wars over the past 30 years have fueled a relentless rise in Afghanistan's opium harvest from about 250 tons in 1979 to 8,200 tons in 2007, that latter figure representing 50% of the country's entire economy and over 90% of the world's illicit opium supply. By 2001, the ecological devastation and social dislocation from 20 years of war made opium the solution to a social crisis so severe, so complex, that it has defied Washington's comprehension. Whipsawed between ignoring the opium crop and demanding its total eradication, the Bush administration dithered for seven years while heroin boomed, creating a drug economy that corrupted and crippled the government of its ally, President Karzai. Today, opium feeds Afghanistan's farmers, employs approximately a quarter of the country's labor force, and it funds the Taliban's insurgency that has, since 2006, revived and spread across the countryside. So pervasive and problematic is opium in Afghanistan today, that we must ask the hard question that Washington has avoided for the past nine years. How can anyone pacify a narco state? The answer to this complex question lies in a history, first, of drug prohibition during the past century, and second, of CIA covered operations during the Cold War. Since the Shanghai Opium Conference of 1909, global drug prohibition has elaborated into a uh, national come international legal structure, which is the basic precondition for the emergence of illicit drugs a century later as a major global commodity with 8% of world trade, 400 billion in global sales, and transnational trafficking syndicates with an estimated 3,500,000 members. 
Moored immediately in each of these three wars fought in Afghanistan over the past 30 years, Washington has tolerated drug trafficking by its Afghan allies as the price of military success, a policy of benign neglect that has helped make Afghanistan the world's number one narco state. First, CIA covered warfare during the 1980s. At the start of the Cold War in the late 1940s, the Iron Curtain came crashing down across the Eurasian landmass. To contain Soviet and communist Chinese expansion, the United States mounted covered operations to probe communism's soft southern underbelly, a highland rim stretching for 5,000 miles across Asia from Turkey to Thailand. For 40 years, the CIA fought a succession of secret wars along this mountain rim, Burma in the 1950s, Laos in the 1960s, and Afghanistan in the 1980s. In one of history's ironic accidents, the Iron Curtain had also fallen along Asia's historic opium zone, drawing the CIA into ambiguous alliances with the region's highland warlords from Laos to Burma and Afghanistan. Washington's first Afghan war began in 1979 when the Soviet Union invaded the country to save its client regime in Kabul. Seeing an opportunity to wound its Cold War enemy, Washington worked with Pakistan in a 10-year CIA campaign to drive the Soviets out of Afghanistan. But this was a covert operation, arguably unlike any other during the 40 years of the Cold War. First, the fusion of CIA covert and Soviet conventional warfare inflicted almost indescribable destruction on Afghanistan's fragile highland ecology, damaging its agriculture almost beyond repair and fostering a growing dependence on the international drug traffic. Second, the CIA, instead of conducting this covert warfare on its own, as it had in Laos, for example, outsourced much of the operation to Pakistan's Inter-Service Intelligence, or ISI, which soon became a powerful and problematic ally. When the ISI proposed its Afghan client, the Islamic fundamentalist Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, as the overall leader of the allied anti-Soviet resistance, Washington, with few alternatives and less intelligence, agreed. As the CIA operation was winding down 10 years later in May 1990, the Washington Post published a page one article charging that the CIA's ally, Hekmatyar, a recipient of over half the $3 billion we had funneled into Afghanistan, was operating a chain of heroin laboratories in Pakistan under the protection of Pakistan's ISI. Now, although this region had zero heroin production in the mid-1970s, by 1981, in the second year of this covert war, the Afghan-Pakistan borderlands had become the world's largest heroin producer. As Afghani guerrillas captured prime agricultural areas inside Afghanistan in the early 1980s, they collected a revolutionary property tax from their peasant supporters, raising opium production tenfold from 250 tons in 1981 to 2,000 tons by 1990. Once the Afghan guerrillas brought the opium across the border, they sold it to the hundreds of Pakistani heroin labs operating under ISI's protection. Across Europe, Afghani and Pakistani heroin captured an even larger share of local markets. In 1981, for example, the US Attorney General announced that Pakistan was the source of 60% of the US heroin supply. Inside Pakistan itself, the number of heroin addicts rose from zero heroin addicts in 1979 to 1 million 200,000 five years later. After investing $3 billion in Afghanistan's destruction, Washington just walked away in 1992, leaving Afghanistan with over a million dead, 5 million refugees, 10 to 20 million landmines, a ravaged infrastructure, a ruined economy, and well-armed tribal warlords ready to fight for power. After the US withdrew, Pakistan's ISI continued to back local warlords and drug lords in pursuit of its long-term goal of installing a Pashtun client regime in Kabul. Next, the Civil War of the 1990s. After the US and USSR withdrew from Afghanistan in 1992, ruthless local warlords combined guns and opium in a brutal struggle for power, almost as if the soil had been sown with the mythic dragon's teeth that bring forth an army full-grown, fully armed warriors, swords drawn for combat. When Hekmatyar failed to take the capital after shelling the city and killing 50,000 people, Pakistan's ISI armed a new force, the Taliban, that captured Kabul in September 1996 and then fought the Northern Alliance for the next five years in the valleys beyond. During this protracted civil war of the 1990s, 
rival factions use opium to finance the fighting, doubling the harvest from 2,000 tons in 1990 to a record of 4,600 tons by 1999. Beneath the surface of this sudden change lurked a fragile ecological balance of field crops, orchards, and herding that could not recover unaided from such unprecedented devastation from 20 years of war. Lying at the northern extremity of the monsoon, where the rain clouds arrive, uh, squeeze dry from the Arabian Sea, Afghanistan is an arid land whose staple food crops have been sustained historically by a delicate snowmelt irrigation system and constantly threatened by drought. <clears throat> to supplement staples such as wheat, tribesmen move vast flocks of sheep and goats hundreds of miles every year to summer pasture in the central uplands. Most importantly, Afghan farmers also planted perennial tree crops, walnut, pistachio, and mulberry, since they root deep, resist drought, and serve as famine relief in the dry years. During these two decades of covert and civil warfare, modern firepower devastated herds, damaged snowmelt irrigation, and destroyed orchards, crippling this fragile ecology's capacity for recovery. The Taliban, with an unerring instinct for their society's economic jugular, violated the rules of traditional warfare by destroying the orchards on the vast Shamali plain north of Kabul. As all of these strands of post-war devastation knitted themselves into a Gordian knot of social, economic, and ecological suffering, op opium became the sole solution, like Alexander's sword of legend, that could cut through these problems. In an arid ecosystem, opium uses half the water of wheat, is drought resistant, lightweight, and easy to transport, <clears throat> stores long term without significant loss, is labor intensive, accumulates capital for dealers, is the highest profit crop for farmers, and provides half the capital handled in the country's vernacular hawala money transfer and money lending system. In marked contrast to its marginal yields for most crops, Afghanistan's climate was ideal for opium, with its average yield per hectare three to five times higher than its chief illicit competitor, Burma. After taking power in 1996, the Taliban regime encouraged a nationwide expansion of opium cultivation, doubling production to a record 4,600 tons in 1999, equivalent to 75% of the world's heroin supply. <clears throat> Instead of banning the drug, the Taliban regime collected $100 million in taxes from both opium production and heroin refining. In retrospect, the Taliban's most important innovation was the introduction of large-scale heroin refining around the city of Jalalabad. But in July 2000, <clears throat> Taliban's Mullah Omar, Omar uh, desperate for international recognition, ordered a sudden ban on all opium cultivation in a and accomplished almost overnight a 90% reduction in the country's opium production, slashing it from 4,000 tons down to 185 metric tons in 2001. But by then, Afghanistan had become an opium monocrat, dependent on poppy production for most of its taxes, export income, and employment. Thus, the Taliban's opium ban was, I think, an act of economic suicide that brought an already weakened society to the brink of collapse. When the US invaded in October 2001, the Taliban regime was already a hollow shell that simply imploded at the burst of the first American bombs. Third and finally, US counterinsurgency warfare since 2001. The outbreak of <clears throat> war with Washington in September 2001 ended the Taliban's opium ban. To defeat the Taliban, the CIA mobilized former warlords long active in the heroin trade to seize towns and cities across eastern Afghanistan. Within weeks, officials reported an outburst of poppy planting in the eastern part of the country. After investing some $3 billion in Afghanistan's destruction during the Cold War, Washington and its allies now proved parsimonious in reconstruction. At the January 2002 Tokyo's donor conference, for example, international representative promised just $4 billion of the estimated $10 billion needed to rebuild the economy over the next five years. Consequently, during the first year of U.S. occupation, Afghanistan's opium harvest surged from 185 tons to 3,400 tons. As opium production continued its relentless rise, Washington downplayed the problem, outsourcing narcotics control to Great Britain 
and police training to Germany. In their counterinsurgency campaign as well, US forces, including the CIA, worked closely with the local warlords who were also leading drug lords. After five years of US occupation, Afghanistan's drug production swelled to unprecedented proportions. In August of 2007, the UN reported that the country's opium crop covered 200,000 hectares, an area larger than all the cocoa fields in Latin America, and yielded 8,200 tons of opium, representing 53% of Afghanistan's gross domestic product and 93% of world heroin supply. Afghanistan had become the world's first real narco state. If a cocaine traffic that provided just 3% of Colombia's GDP could bring endless violence and powerful cartels, then we can only imagine the consequences of an Afghanistan dependence on opium for over 50% of its economic activity. Indeed, opium's influence is so pervasive that corruption cripples every government activity, compromising every attempt at opium eradication. Not only have drug taxes funded an expanding Taliban guerrilla force, but their role in protecting opium farmers and the heroin merchants give them control over the nation's core political economy. Since that record crop of 2007, opium production has declined somewhat to 6,900 tons last year, still representing over 90% of the world's opium supply. The UN attributes this 20% reduction <clears throat> of 7, 000, uh, to, to, uh, to eradication efforts, but a more likely cause was the global glut of heroin that depressed farm gate opium prices by 34%. Even this reduced Afghan opium crop of about 7,000 tons is still well above world demand at 5,000 tons per annum, creating downward market pressures on both price and production. Although preliminary reports on the 2010 crop indicate a steady state, the UN is not optimistic about long-term trends. Opium prices might decline, but the poppy is still the most profitable crop for Afghan farmers. In this ancient land sown with dragon's teeth, we are locked into an endless cycle of drugs and death. Every spring in these rugged mountains, the snows melt, the opium seeds sprout, and a fresh crop of Taliban fighters take to the field to be gunned down by lethal American fire. And the next year, the snows melt again, the poppy comes through the soil, and a new crop of teenage Taliban fighters takes to the field to fight America. Is there any alternative to this endless Sisyphean cycle that we've been engaged in for the past 10 years? Even if the cost of rebuilding Afghanistan's rural economy with orchards, flocks, and food crops is as high as 30 billion or even 90 billion dollars, we have the money right at hand. By conservative estimates, the cost of President Obama's ongoing surge of 30,000 troops is 30 billion a year, every year for the foreseeable future. Although slow and costly, Crop substitution, akin to the UN drug control program in Thailand during the 1980s, is the only public policy option without a proven record of disastrous, unanticipated consequences. Short of another precipitous withdrawal akin to 1991, Washington really has no realistic alternative to the costly, long-term reconstruction of Afghanistan's agriculture. The idea that our expanded military might soon hand over pacification to the illiterate, drug-addicted Afghani police and army remains, for the time being, pure fantasy. Quick fixes like paying poppy farmers not to plant, something British and Americans have both tried, can backfire and incentivize expanded production. Rapid drug eradication without alternative employment, like that the DynCorp, a US defense contractor, did so disastrously under 150 million contract in 2005, would simply plunge the Afghan a country into misery, stoking mass anger and destabilizing the Kabul government. So our choice is clear. We can renew this arid ancient land by replanting or assisting the people in replanting orchards, replenishing the flocks and rebuilding the snow melt irrigation for food crops. Or we can instead water this dragon's tea soil with more blood and an endless cycle of drugs and death. At this point, I would argue, our only realistic choice is rural development, that is, reconstructing the Afghan countryside through countless small-scale projects until food crops become a viable economic alternative to opium. To put it simply, so simply that even Washington might understand, we can only pacify a narco-state when it is no longer a narco-state. Thank you.
I'll be talking about issues that are a little bit closer to, a little more close to home, I guess you could say. Uh, I'll be talking about the American and Mexican drug wars. Uh, I just uh, read in the paper that yesterday seven policemen were murdered in Ciudad Juarez, adjacent to El Paso, where I live and where I do research. And since January 2008, 5,100 people have died in the drug wars in Ciudad Juarez alone. This year, over 750 people have died. And so perhaps when we talk about low-intensity conflict, maybe we should shift this and talk about high-intensity conflict. But the problem here is that I believe that the United States is exporting its drug war to Mexico with terrible consequences for Mexico. This has been going on for about 40 years. The US has been trying to get Mexico to stop producing marijuana and heroin. Uh, Mexico produces one-third of the heroin for the US market. But now we're bringing, uh, that is, Mexico is bringing most of the cocaine that comes into the United States. And now Mexico is a big producer of methamphetamine. I'm just going to give you sort of the high spots of the recent drug wars in Mexico, focusing on the period between 2006 and the present. Uh, the, the present, sorry. Um, in 2006, the U.S. supported President Felipe Calderón, who won an election against the left-wing candidate López Obrador. Uh, Calderón won by a very small margin. And when he came into office, the first thing he did was to don a military uniform and go out with the Mexican soldiers and say, now we're going to fight a war against the drug cartels, because Mexico has been suffering a great deal of drug violence for many years, but also tremendous crime and public insecurity. So the new president, Calderon, then sent 45,000 troops into the main drug-controlled areas, drug cartel-controlled areas of Mexico. I have here on the, the slide the seven main Mexican drug cartels, the Sinaloa or Chapo Guzman cartel. Remember, Chapo Guzman was listed as number 700 on Forbes' list of the richest people in the world. There's the Juarez cartel that up till recently dominated Ciudad Juarez, where I do research, but the Chapo Guzman cartel is taking that over. There's the Tijuana cartel and all the other cartels that are listed there. I've suggested a new language to talk about these cartels that uh, it sort of uh, implicates the United States in the functioning and the, the reason for these cartels' existence. So I've argued that we should call the Juarez cartel the Juarez El Paso Chicago cartel. And I've said that the Sinaloa cartel could be called the Culiacan Chicago cartel to indicate the degree to which American demand fosters this business, but also that Americans are involved in trafficking. And so this is clearly a binational and a transnational problem. But these cartels have become so large and so powerful now that their weaponry is more powerful than that of the Mexican military. A number of these cartels have their own uniforms separate from that of the Mexican military. The Cartel del Golfo, the Gulf Cartel, has insignia, stickers on their SUVs that say Gulf Cartel. And there's a group called La Familia Michoacana in the state of Michoacan, which is the main port through which cocaine comes into Mexico and then to come to the United States, that has even their own Bible, believe it or not, a drug cartel with an evangelical sort of Protestant Bible. So I would argue that Mexico is not a failed state and it's not a narco state, but there are six states in Mexico that are clearly controlled or heavily dominated by drug cartels. Those are Chihuahua, Tamaulipas, Durango, Sinaloa, uh, Michoacan, and I think I forgot one. Uh, but there, this situation is really terribly out of control in Mexico. And so the military being sent there to fight these cartels supposedly has been a failed policy because the military is either completely hopeless and inept or else thoroughly corrupted or some mix of both. But Calderon sent the military into these cartel territories and took over the police force in Ciudad Juarez and other cities. And in most cases, they either lost direct battles with the cartels, or they sat around and did nothing as people were slaughtered in the streets. Or as in Ciudad Juarez, I would argue, the military actually worked with the Chapo Guzman cartel to clean out members of the Juarez cartel and take over the Juarez Plaza. In the meantime, the military has committed thousands of human rights violations, including kidnapping people, torturing them, and murdering them. So there's widespread corruption in the Mexican military, even though uh, the United States continues to insist that they're winning the war in Mexico and that we should support the military. But any Mexican knows that even small children know that the police are corrupt at every level, at the city level, at the state level, and at the federal level, because this is all about the control of this huge $30 billion US market for drugs.
There's a writer named Charles Bowden I would recommend to you his work if you want to understand a bit more about the, the supposed war on drugs in Mexico. Charles Bowden argues that this is actually in Mexico a war for drugs rather than a war on drugs. But the sad consequences of this, this drug war, if you want to call it that, are uh, since 2006 when Calderon took office, 23,000 drug-related murders, thousands of kidnappings, and incidentally, 10% of the victims of these killings are women. And this is a very shocking statistic. Now, we've probably, many of you may have heard of the killings of women in Ciudad Juarez, the so-called femicides, where more than 400 women were brutally tortured and then murdered, often uh, raped in, prior to being murdered. And this attracted international attention. But these days, three or four times as many women are murdered in drug violence, and it seems to me that they're not attracting the same amount of support internationally because it's drug-related. But Ciudad Juarez, where I do research, and which is located absolutely adjacent to El Paso, has now become the murder capital of the world with statistics of 150 to 200 murders per 100,000 population. So I would argue that the United States is very much implicated in this violence and that the Mexican cartels have grown extremely powerful vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. And so there's a kind of spillover of cartel structure. Mexican cartels control the drug market in more than 200 U.S. cities. There has not been a massive spillover of drug violence into the United States, although there have been murders in Dallas and El Paso, Phoenix, L.A., and other cities. But you do, do see the victims of, these drug, uh, of the drug violence coming to be treated in U.S. hospitals. Hundreds of people have come to El Paso hospitals to be treated for bullet wounds. And there's a kind of exodus from border cities such as Ciudad Juarez and other cartel-dominated areas. In Juarez alone, the, statistically, there are 116,000 houses which have been abandoned, much of this in relation to the drug violence. And estimates say as many as 30 to 500,000 people have left Juarez because of the drug conflict. So this whole thing is all about money and control of drug plazas, and it's produced a tremendous level of violence, which has actually generated a whole lexicon to refer to the types of violence. Some of these are listed there. In Cajuelados are people murdered, then put in the trunks of cars, and then the bodies are discovered when the, the bodies start smelling terribly, and people wonder what's going on in the car. En Tambados are people killed and then put in 55-gallon drums. Frequently, when people are kidnapped, they are taped with duct tape around their mouth, their eyes, their body. These are called entapados. There's also encobijados, people that are tortured, killed, and then wrapped in blankets, their bodies thrown in the streets of Mexican cities, especially Juarez. Now, this language is really horrifying, but it's meant to be horrifying. To burn someone with acid and dissolve their body is called to hacer pozole, to make pozole. I don't know if you're familiar with pozole. It's similar to menudo, but it's a red, soupy kind of food. Or to do a guiso to make a stew would be also cooking the body with acid, or you could burn the body, and this is referred to as a carne asada. There's also a wave of decapitations. People killed because they're considered enemies or snitches against a cartel. There's already been thousands of such decapitations. And in some massacres of, of enemies of a cartel, there have been as many as two dozen people murdered. So this is really a situation that's terribly out of control. It's developed its own symbolic language of violence and torture. Bodies are mutilated, uh, fingers cut off if a person snitched on a cartel, their tongue cut off for the same reason. If members of rival cartels catch people of the Setas group, they grab them, tie them up, torture them, and carve their body and write a big, huge Z on the stomach to indicate they were members of the setas. Many times after people are killed, their bodies are hung from bridges right in the center of Mexican cities or in buildings, public plazas, monuments. Sometimes the bodies are decorated by putting a mask on the body, a pig face, to insult the rival cartel. And there are many types of torture, including especially poking people, stabbing people to death with ice picks in order to create internal bleeding, which is intensely painful, but also doesn't leave a big mess. Uh, 
So it really is a situation that's out of control. This violence, is, I would argue, is a form of narco-propaganda in which cartels attack their rivals, they intimidate the government, they int intimidate any group that would oppose them, and often this involves emasculation, such as cutting off the genitals. And many times at a body dump, there's a sign placed explaining what the cartel was trying to do. They also generate YouTube videos of murders and massacres. Uh, there's also what are called narco blogs, that is blogs devoted to drug cartels. This is very a kind of modern cyber warfare. But I see no end in sight to this drug war because the United States continues to, to back the Calderon administration. And the problem clearly is binational because the, the market for these drugs is of course the United States. At the same time we promote the so-called war on drugs. But also, the United States is a very easy place to purchase high-powered weaponry and smuggle it into the United States. But also, we need to look at Mexico to explain what's going on, especially the long history of corruption within the government, a tremendous problem of poverty that the government has been unable to alleviate, and a growing problem of crime in all major cities in Mexico. Now, I don't know what exactly is the solution to this problem because in Mexico, the, as I've already said, the police and military are terribly inefficient and often on the payroll of drug cartels. So in the short term, we have the U.S. government's policy, the Merida Initiative, which is to continue to back the Mexican military to give them hardware, money, technology, intelligence capabilities, but I would argue that this uh, policy of the war on drugs, both in the United States and Mexico, is bad for both countries and a failure. So let me stop there. We'll have plenty of time, I'm sure, to discuss this more and perhaps compare it to Afghanistan and other areas. Thank you. I think if, uh, if what Howard has described is not war, I don't know what is. Uh, we've heard uh, of the experience in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We've heard of the experience in Mexico. I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of the American drug war. In one sense, it's, it does go back to, uh, to the beginning of prohibition. I'm now talking about uh, prohibited drugs as we define them today. We did have an experience with prohibition from 1920 to 1933 that you're all aware of that was not uh, spectacularly successful and in fact was brought to uh, a, a blessed end uh, with the repeal of the Volstead Act. But take yourselves back to 1971. You are Richard Milhouse Nixon, the 37th president of this country. Uh, your administration is bogged down in a very unpopular war in Southeast Asia. Uh, the deficit is burgeoning inflation is rising, you are in no way guaranteed re-election. So what do you do? Well, why not declare war on drugs? Now he inherited the more conventionally defined war in Vietnam, uh, but this was an opportunity for a law and order president uh, to stake out what he knew to be very popular territory. What is the constituency represented, the, the political constituency with all of the force and pressure behind that that is represented by drug users? Drugs are bad. They're evil, they're sinister, they're nasty, they're frightening. They are subjected to much uh, sensational reporting in the popular media. Drugs are bad. People who take them are bad. So it was a natural. Nixon then decided after having chosen to declare war on drugs to do as uh, many presidents do, and that is assemble a justification or a rationale for his new policy after he'd already decided on the policy. So he summoned to the White House a variety of drug policy luminaries, including Art Linkletter, uh, who showed up and uh, against a backdrop of the uh, ubiquitous recording system that was the Oval Office under the Nixon administration, much to his dismay, uh, began talking about marijuana versus alcohol. And it was uh, Linkletter's position, echoed by Nixon, that people who smoke marijuana are on, uh, on course to be taking harder drugs, that it was essentially inevitable because marijuana clearly was a gateway drug. If you smoke marijuana, 
the next thing you're going to want to do is stick a needle in your arm because you're not getting a sufficiently uh, high high from marijuana. Uh, those who drink alcohol, for example, can bring uh, to a merciful conclusion the ravaging effects of booze by vomiting. I, I call that the Art Link letter uh, vomiting as cure theory. Uh, Nixon echoed that and said, in fact, I enjoy my silver bullets every night, his nickname for a gin martini, which he literally did consume in significant quantities each night. At one point, toward the end of his administration, chasing dilantin, which I understand is a, an anti-epileptic drug, with some pretty bizarre side effects that you don't want to see manifest in a president uh, and leader of the free world. But on June 17, 1971, Nixon proclaimed drugs public en en enemy number one and declared all-out war on them. Since that time, we have spent $1 trillion prosecuting the American drug war. And I emphasize the American drug war because we are the four-star general in the global war on drugs. Now, in that declaration of war, against drugs, he was really declaring war on his own people. He was particularly declaring war on young people, poor people, and people of color, whose numbers are wildly disproportionately represented across the criminal justice spectrum, from the stop and frisks uh, in every community in this country, to the arrests, to the charging, to the prosecution, to the conviction, and in fact the incarceration. Uh, of, once again, grossly disproportionate numbers of young people, poor people, and black people particularly, but also brown people in this country. Well, we have now spent a trillion dollars prosecuting the war. We have incarcerated tens of millions of nonviolent drug offenders. What do we have to show for it? Drugs are more readily available at lower prices and higher levels of potency than before Richard Nixon declared war on them. So it has been a, an extraordinary, colossal failure in public policy. It has not worked. It has not achieved um, its intended objective. And it has caused enormous direct and collateral damage. Uh, those tens of millions of people are not just numbers, obviously. They are human beings, many of whom are ill by definition because they are addicts who have been incarcerated, in some cases, for very long periods of time, nowhere more uh, troubling than in the state of New York, which we are now beginning to uh, see a, a dismantling of the draconian Rockefeller laws. These are people for the possession of small amount of marijuana who are sentenced to years and years and years in prison, for example. The girlfriends, the spouses, talking about that 10% figure, uh, Howard, uh, of women who are victims of, of the war for drugs in Mexico. In this country, we've seen a significant escalation in the number of arrests and uh, prison incarcerations of women uh, who did not know in many cases that their dealer boyfriends or husbands had parked the stash uh, in, in, in their personal belongings or who in some fashion or another are simply caught up innocently. Some are not, many are caught up innocently in this drug war. We've also seen the fracture, by definition, the fracturing of families. We've seen people lose their student loans. We've seen people uh, evicted from public, uh, federally subsidized housing, on and on and on. Uh, in short, the drug war has caused far more harm than good. I contend that it is time to end it. I think it is time for us to recognize that prohibition has never worked, it never will work, it can't work. There are simply too many of us in search of mood or mind-altering uh, drugs. Uh, it is very clear that some of those drugs, particularly marijuana, uh, are far safer than alcohol, and in terms of their health costs, certainly tobacco. We have reduced tobacco consumption dramatically. Somebody said like 50% in, 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 in recent years. Without a single shot being fired, without a single person going to jail behind that campaign to uh, alert people to the risks, the health risks, the personal risks associated uh, 
with uh, tobacco use. We know that there has never been a single overdose death attributed to marijuana, and to marijuana only, by the way. I'm not suggesting that someone who's drunk two-fifths of tequila and then smokes a joint is not in danger of overdosing. But I think it's very important to point out that when we look at the public health and safety implications of alcohol versus tobacco, for example, and we declare war against one of those drugs, and we embrace and, in fact, celebrate another of those, just check out Super Bowl Sunday for ample evidence of how we celebrate Budweiser and, and other alcoholic beverages. The point of all of this is the drug war has caused far more harm than good. It is time to take the commerce out of the unregulated, monopolized, greedy and evil hands of drug traffickers, whether they be the Mexican cartels whose influence is now felt in over 230 American cities as they have literally set up operations uh, in urban areas as well as national park lands and the like. Uh, take it out of their hands because they don't card 14-year-olds. They don't care what they sell to whom. All that matters to them is the hand-to-hand -hand deal behind the, the, the middle school gym uh, that nets a new customer and preferably a loyal and continuing customer. They don't care what's in the product that they sell. All they care about is money. The government, admittedly imperfect, is a far better means or, or represents a far better means of the regulation of all drugs, not just the so-called soft drugs, not just the botanicals, but the synthetics. All currently prohibited drugs must, in my view, and the view of an organization to which I belong called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, be legalized such that they can be regulated and taxed and controlled. So we have a choice. We can either leave the $400 billion global illicit drug industry in the hands of very greedy and dangerous people or we can, in fact, legalize all drugs, uh, uh, cut the illicit traffickers off at the knees, as we were suggesting yesterday in a preliminary conversation. These people are not going to go out of business. They're going to find another line of work. Thank you. They're going to find another line of work. And uh, Howard was mentioning several yesterday. Uh, I, I would simply add to his list human trafficking and gun running. I think those are naturals for greedy and evil people. But if in fact we were to end the drug war today, replace the regulatory model, or excuse me, the prohibition model with a regulatory model, we would not stop the campaign to find the heads of these cartels. The people who have killed have murdered in multiple numbers, who have engaged in unspeakable forms of violence, and who have capitalized enormously financially uh, from their role in, in the drug war. Finally, I just want to conclude with suggesting that uh, there are a lot of people who are opposed to what I'm saying. Some of them because they are true believers. Drugs are bad, and people who take them shouldn't, whether or not they are bad. There are also people who benefit directly and financially from the drug war. They are, of course, the drug warriors. Nixon allocated $144 million, got congressional authorization to spend $144 million starting in 1971. To his credit, over 100 and, like 101 million of those dollars were dedicated to treatment. Uh, of all the presidents, all eight, all seven since Nixon, he has been uh, that one president who has shown some appreciation of the need for and the value of prevention and education and treatment. Others express support for all of that, but if you look at the budgets of the Office of Nas National Drug Control Policy, you will see that the lion's share and continuing and the continuing growth of that lion's share on the enforcement or interdiction side of the equation. So I, I, I guess what I would say is there are people, my former colleagues in law enforcement who have become dependent, some might say addicted to the revenue stream 
that is associated with support for local law enforcement in carrying out drug, way, drug raids and putting narcs on the streets and in the schools and so on and so forth. Uh, Big Pharma has been identified or implicated as an opponent of drug policy reform. Uh, the tobacco industry, the vintners, the brewers, the distributors, unless they have an eye on a license themselves under a new regulatory system would be opposed to this. But at the very top of the list, I would put the drug dealers. Al Capone loved prohibition. It invented him. The incredible, unprecedented levels of violence on city streets that accompany prohibition from 1920 to 1933 uh, and caused all of that harm was not something that bothered Al Capone. Uh, the iconic prohibition speakeasy city, of course, was Chicago. And you have images, I certainly do, of those magnificent big black shiny Fords uh, turning a corner on two wheels with a Tommy submachine gun sticking out the back and, uh, and, and blasting away, for example, at an Italian restaurant with lots of innocent people caught in the crossfire, with people dying of, of drug overdose deaths in the form of bad bathtub gin. Prohibition then did not work. Prohibition now is not working, and it's costing us way too much money in li and, and lives uh, to maintain this uh, prohibition model. So I will also close with the idea that we can have some time for conversation. I hope we do. Um, if this matters to you and you want to participate in this reform effort, I urge you uh, to sign a petition for 1068 in the state of Washington to send, I don't care, $4.20 or $100 to the 2010 campaign to tax and regulate uh, and control cannabis in the state of California. It's on the ballot, it's polling at 56%. Conventional wisdom, all the political scientists say that figure is soft. As we get closer to November, you will have the opponents coming out of the woodwork and screaming bloody murder, and many of them, frankly, and unfortunately, will be some of my former colleagues. I think it's important to question them and to, if you agree with the need, to end the drug war, to support these local initiatives. Politicians follow, they don't lead. It's not gonna come from Obama, bless his heart, who's made some nice and positive statements. It's not gonna come from my successor, uh, Gil Kurlikowski, who was the police chief, obviously, here in the city of Seattle, and is now the drug czar. And who has said, marijuana legalization is not in our vocabulary, it's a non-starter. Well, I don't imagine, uh, I can't imagine a more un-American statement than that. And we need to talk about this, and I'll shut up so we can. Thank you very much. Um, so what the next phase of our panel will be is um, I'm going to go briefly to each of the panelists who just spoke and ask them if they would like to respond to what the other panelists have said, just like one to two minutes. And b before I turn that over, I want to also uh, state from kind of the health and public health angle, I think I'm the only one up here who has um, that background, that a very important um, position for us to take is accurate health information about substances. The drug war uh, in the United States is actually under a fake public health model. Uh, the, the actual law that controls these banned drugs is called the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act. Sounds like a very kind of public health language, but uh, interestingly enough, zero input from public health experts um, or medical review panels goes into actual drug information and classification. And the American Public Health Association has for many years said that we have to have a public health approach to, the, to drug issues. Um, in, in President Obama, when he was Senator Obama campaigning, uh, he said that we have to look at the public health impacts of the drug trade. And um, it's really an important player missing at the table is uh, the health information uh, about these drugs. So um, I just want you to keep that in mind as another casualty of uh, the war, a war a mentality is the lack of accurate health information about substances. And I'll give you more examples as time goes on. But um, let's, let me ask Dr. McCoy if he has uh, one or two minutes of response to uh, what he's heard so far. Uh, sure. Um I found uh, Norm's comments 
very thought-provoking. Uh, and he raised a very important question. Why can't we end the drug war? Uh, it's clear that, first of all, it's a, after 100 years of prohibition, it's a failed policy. The U.S. incarceration rate <clears throat> since we domesticated the drug war under Ronald Reagan has gone from 100 per 100,000 uh, prisoners in the United States to 800 per 100,000 with about 2 million people in prisons. Drug production simultaneously has gone up. Let's just take heroin. When Nixon declared war on drugs back in 1971, his estimate of world supply of opium was 1,200 tons. Today it's 8,000 tons. To that we've are added a massive expansion of cocaine, methamphetamines, and marijuana traffic, making drugs now, according to the UN, 8% of world trade. And <clears throat> we've, the, another cost, of course, is that at state government levels, we're devoting a disproportionate share of our budget, state budgets, to prisons rather than education. We have the world's, among the developed nations of the world, we have the world's highest prison population, and we have the world's worst elementary education system. And there's a causal relationship between those two. Uh, <clears throat> what, I, what I think that has been achieved and why the drug war has lasted globally for a century and then domestically for 40 years is that we've achieved a bureaucratic stasis. At a domestic level, we've got a, a, a convergence of interests at the very broadest bureaucratic level between prison pop, prisons cited in, in impoverished rural districts with disproportionate electoral power, a capacity of social control, an extension of federal government policing power, which historically it's never had over states and localities through drugs. Drugs is one of the few areas that gives the federal government a reach into local communities and control over local policing. Uh, transnationally, internationally, we've created a prohibition treaty, a regime of uh, international drug control effort through the UN and 300 treaties banning drugs. And uh, internationally and domestically at an ideological level, we have a policy debate that is moral, not rational. So it's actually not weighed up. It's not uh, the, 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 this, this, compu this rational computation of cost and benefit, which is the usual matrix for the examination critique of every other form of policy, does not apply to drugs. Okay. Well, is there, is, finally, is there a hope? Yes, there is hope. I think hope is in the inexorable economic decline of the United States as a major power. Okay? This capacity to finance this massive incarceration and this irrational social policy was only due to our extraordinary economic preeminence during the Cold War. And as we lose our global competitiveness and we lose our preeminent international economic position, we can no longer afford this domestic irrationality. And that's what is going to ultimately force an end to this. Because one of the reasons that this has existed for so long is there's been no countervailing force against this international and domestic bureaucratic stasis. Thank you. Professor Campbell? I don't really want to comment on what Norm and Al said because I agree with most of it. I just wanted to add some information about why so many Mexican people are going into the drug trade. Just some basic numbers about what people are paid for this work. To be a hitman or a sicario for a drug cartel, one hit a person is paid between $100 and 1000 So that tells you something about how cheap life has become in Mexico, and only 2 to 3% of homicides ever are uh, punished. So essentially crime pays in Mexico. But to walk across the border about 30 or 40 miles with a homemade burlap back backpack with about 100 pounds of marijuana in it, and then to walk back, a person is paid about $1,000, or maybe as much as $1,500. To drive a car across the border, a car loaded with coke or pot, the driver gets $1,000 just to go from, say, Ciudad Juarez or another border town into a, a Mexican, I mean, into an American town, they, they get paid 1000 To drive a car from Ciudad Juarez loaded with drugs to Chicago, the payment is $10,000. So I would argue that all of this has to do with economics, the poverty of Mexico generated by the U.S.'s free trade agreement and sort of political domination and economic domination of Mexico, which is forcing poor people in Mexico to go into the heinous drug trade. Thank you. Dr. Stamper? Could you pass him the microphone? Well, I, I wanted to also add something just very quickly and then ask a, a 
question of Howard, uh, and actually of Al as well. Marijuana is the biggest cash crop in the United States of America. It literally sits at the top of, of three states. Uh, it's in the top three of 12 states and in the top five of 39 states. And not a single tax, <laughs> not a single one of those growers is paying a dime in taxes. So the uh, initiative in California, according to the Board of Equalization, the tax collector of the state of Washington, will net a cool $1.4 billion for a state that's teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, so I'm just expressing support for what's already been said ab about how uh, current and future economic forces will drive this policy debate. Uh, it's about time. It's a shame that it did, in fact, um, uh, it will require us to confront uh, the, the, the sort of moral versus rational uh, debate that has been so necessary. Uh, yesterday, Howard, you mentioned something uh, to the effect that if, for example, uh, drug policy were radically and suddenly transformed in this country, what would be the effect on the economy of Mexico? And I guess we could ask the same question of, of Afghanistan. I mean, in the short term, the effect on the Mexican economy would be disastrous. Uh, the cartels get 40 to 50 percent of their revenue from marijuana production and trafficking, and what would Mexico do to replace that, given that oil reserves are shrinking, tourism is drying up or dying because of the H1N1 flu, and then also because of all the violence in Mexico, and then the general financial crisis. Mexico is really hurting economically, and then the United States built 700 miles of wall to prevent Mexican immigrant workers from coming across. So they really don't have anything to fill the void. So legalization of marijuana would cause actually uh, problems in Mexico in the short term. To, to engage in an utter uh, hypothetical exercise, what would happen to Afghanistan if overnight the UN suddenly passed a motion ratified by the 200 sovereign nations of the world that ended the drug war after 100 years, uh, uh, opium would disappear very quickly from Afghanistan because uh, opium would become a legal commodity. Australia produces opium for legitimate pharmaceuticals at the cost of, I think, $56 a kilo. Afghanistan produces illicit opium at the cost of $450 a kilo. Why is Afghanistan nine times more expensive than Australia, despite the low labor cost in Afghanistan? Because it doesn't have the agricultural infrastructure to support the efficient production of any crop, including opium. The only reason that Afghanistan can become the world's dominant opium producer is because the, the commodity is illegal. But to then return the realm of the realistic, given the complexity and the depth of the global prohibition regime, which operates at three tiers, one over 300 treaties uh, ratified by the nations of the world to bring them into force, banning drugs and related activities, two national laws, including national anti-drug laws in the United States, and then in the United States, state laws. So you have a three-tier legal prohibition regime that's deeply rooted, and for this to change, it would have to be unraveled at the na international, the national, and then much more easily, the state level. And that's a process that would take uh, a, a, an unforeseeable amount of time, perhaps a century, another century. It would, it would take an equal amount of time of unraveling this. Uh, and l right now, the United Nations had a major international drug summit on the floor of the General Assembly, I think it was in 1997, and that produced, if you will, a greatly expanded international police apparatus. Uh, before there was just Interpol, now the UN has got the UN office, it used to be the UN Drug Control Program, it's now the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, and there are now transnational treaties on illegal criminal activity on money laundering. In other words, we've globalized our prohibition regime. It, it's go so I, I can't imagine that the same international body would reassemble, let's say, in even 10 years and totally reverse that position. So it's, it's a very long time, and it's going to take a very serious and protracted debate and countless tens of thousands of sessions like this one before rationality intrudes and we we unwind this regime. I don't know, maybe you would be. Well, 
Norm, you could comment on that because you've had much more practical experience. Well, I, I'd be happy to con uh, uh, comment on that. I spent the month of October in Australia, uh, and everywhere I went, I heard law enforcement officials, public officials, members of parliament, think tanks, and so forth. Everyone was talking about the UN Treaty. And I said, I, I just need to tell you this. I've been talking about this issue for a long, long time, literally decades. Not once in any conversation, any debate, any speech that I've heard, have I heard mention of the UN Treaty. Not once. We're the United States. If we don't like a treaty, we ignore it, right? I mean, that's been our norm. Uh, if we, in fact, are the uh, political force behind that treaty, as I contend we are, then it means something to us, and it means so much to us that we don't even have to talk about it. So I'm essentially supporting what you're talking about, and that is that it's so deeply embedded. I do believe uh, re reversing that process that, that you were talking about, Al, it's at the grassroots level with these local initiatives. We have 14 states that embrace medical marijuana, several others uh, in the wings. We have decriminalization laws in many of our states. We have in the city of Seattle, we were the first to do this, marijuana enforcement as the lowest priority of the police department and the city attorney's office, lower than jaywalking. Now, that's, that's kind of chipping away at, at what we really need to do, but those initiatives, uh, Washington and Oregon are trying to get uh, initiatives on the ballot for this year. California, is, as I mentioned, is already on the ballot. Now, the federal government does trump local law enforcement. Uh, and, and they have for a long time. But there's a lot of interest, I think, on the part of political figures for the citizens to basically give them political cover by saying, we recognize the insanity of this and we're gonna take action at the local level and create enough of that, which I think is underway and really has had a shot in the arm in the last year. Uh, it, it will, in fact, force our state and federal governments to come on board. Eventually. Let's, uh, let's turn it over now to some audience participation. We have, uh, looks like, 15, 17 minutes. i uh, just like to encourage you to uh, come to the microphones on the other side. Keep your questions short uh, in the interest of time. If you like, you can state, state who you are, where you're from. Ladies first. Okay. This, uh, this is for Norma. Filmmaker first. I, I, th I find it really interesting, you know, that, that you're talking about this and you're a former police chief. And, and it's, it strikes me that um, because you know that the, uh, you know, drug supply is directly related to U.S. foreign and uh, economic trade policies, um, that um, you know, if you, you're a police chief, to enforce these laws is pretty seems pretty cynical, especially when you're getting a lot of money for it. And uh, so I wonder, like, uh, how many other police chiefs that you, in your experience, actually know this and what your thoughts are? Because it is a kind of a corruption, isn't it? Well, I'm sorry, yes it is. Uh, and, and it's a good and fair question. Well, I would say yes it is, let me, let me clarify that. Uh, in all of my talks, uh, dating back to the 90s, actually my first aha experience about the drug war before it was even proclaimed uh, was uh, back in the late 60s when I arrested a 19-year-old kid in his own home after kicking in his door for a handful of weeds and, and, and you know, stems and, and seeds um, and drove him to jail with his hands cuffed behind his back. He's sitting there saying, oh wow, you know, look at this cage, you know, you got any Fritos or Cheetos? And, um, and I'm thinking, you know, I could be doing real police work. I could be arresting a drunk driver right now. I could be intervening in a domestic violence situation. I could, in short, be doing real police work that stops people from hurting other people. That was my first aha experience. Over the course of my career, uh, my views actually became more informed and they, and, and they took on greater strength. Point of all of this is, do not ask your local police department to stop enforcing drug laws. Tell your local police department that you want a low priority. That's not no priority, it's a low priority. Signal to your local law enforcement agency that you don't want to spend so much money incarcerating people, on and on and on. The last thing you want is cops, from beat cops to narcs to police chiefs, deciding what they are going to enforce. Not in our 
form of government. And if you want to talk about corruption, ask the question if cops are not enforcing vice laws, if they're not enforcing narcotics laws, however ill-conceived those laws are, what are they doing? Are they pocketing money? Are they engaged in a pattern of corruption? And the qu his question was about what about other police chiefs? What is their perspective? Police chiefs, I have met sheriffs, superintendents, commissioners across the country have oftentimes whispered their support. They won't say it out loud. You get a beat cop that wants to be a homicide detective, the last thing he's going to start doing is spouting off about uh, an end to the drug war, recognizing that uh, substantial money comes to the organization as a result of the drug war. But a lot of police officers uh, will quietly, well, they'll, they'll whisper their support. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'd like you to, because I tried to call on you first, so please go ahead. No um, I just wanted to thank the panelists. I think a lot of what you said is really illuminating. Um, I have a question. I am in support of um, legalizing a lot of drugs, but I would ask, um, how do you plan to regulate really highly addicted substances, excuse me, such as meth or heroin? I mean, how can you really regulate the legalization of such drugs in a health conscious manner where, as I'm under the impression that methamphetamines are often addictive with the first hit? Um, and I also would ask, do you think that economic revitalization, which I know has a lot to do with the meth industry in particular, and education are just as or more important than regulation and legalization? Well, let, let me first agree with you that meth is a very dangerous drug. Crystal meth, particularly the manufacture of it, it's explosive, it's toxic, it's scary in a neighborhood, it's scary in a home or a hotel room or the back of a trunk or in a double wide trailer. It's really a bad situation. And it's here. Pro it's, we have prohibition that says you can't do that. It's here. And it is dangerous. And so I would argue that the more dangerous, the more sinister a particular drug, the more uh, potential uh, for abuse a given drug happens to be, the greater the justification for the government to regulate it rather than uh, drug dealers. And, and let me just respond as well. Um, methamphetamine is actually sold in pharmacies. Uh, its other isomer is manufactured in Indiana and used in medical treatment on a daily basis, routinely, regularly, treatment of narcolepsy, attention deficit disorder. Uh, heroin has been used in the North American Opiate Maintenance Initiative just, just up in Vancouver, BC, just 100 miles up north, they administered heroin or dilaudid, uh, blinded to long-term chronic heroin addicts and were able to actually reduce the amount of social disarray and disorder in their lives, essentially medicalizing their um, dependence on this, on this drug, which is um, a very doable prospect as shown in these trials, in, these, in, these, in this research and regular clinical practice. So it's about getting that information out to people. A lot of drug effects have to do with the social context in which they're used. Uh, and that's, um, that's something I'd encourage you to take a look at in terms of regulatory models. Oh, you want to say I just wanted to say that because of the Mexican drug war, it's harder to get drugs through Mexico into the United States. And consequently, the cartels are oftentimes now passing off uh, cocaine as meth. That is, they're, they're selling what they claim to be cocaine, but it's actually meth. There you go. OK, uh, to, to this side of the room for a moment. Yes, sir. I just want to make a couple of comments on the base of my experience as a physician working with uh, narcotic addicts and troubled youth in the 70s. Uh, Nixon wasn't all that uh, progressive in his legislation. The reason he came in with those programs was because half of the soldiers in Vietnam were addicted to 90% heroin. What you get on the streets of the United States is one to three percent heroin. So he created massive treatment program and all these soldiers came back and a few of them stumbled, but a lot of them just went back to their normal lives, walking away from the most horrendous narcotic habits the world has probably ever seen. The other thing is Afghanistan produces also about half the world's uh, hashish, as I'm, and it's, that's never mentioned. But one of the things that I think is, that is a direct result is the militarization of our culture to now where emergency response teams look like SWAT teams. People that check your baggage at airports now dress like they're members of SWAT teams. And I think as physicians, we have to be concerned. This is eroding the mentality and the security and the consciousness of our patients. It's creating a terror a neo-fascist security state, and Canada is not far behind you, such that doctors will have to keep prescribing drugs more and more, they're less effective. And when I did a, the UN did a study in the late 70s, Canadian and American physicians 
prescribed 50% more narcotics to their patients than uh, doctors in Britain, Russia. They were compared against very significant and similar countries and some that were not so significant. And I think as physicians, we have the main element that keeps a drug war going, keeps corporate government sanctioning of the war on drugs is the misinformation that is provided and physicians are the gatekeepers of a lot of the drugs that are being used, abused, and we have to be better informed and I think we're delinquent in that regard in terms of educating new medical students and our patients. Thank you, and Doctor. And this will go on. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Gould, thank you for your comment. You've been waiting. Um, I had uh, first uh, one comment to share. Uh, it may be known, but uh, I remember having a conversation with Dr. Bob Livingston, who's uh, president of PSR in 1992, who's a very prominent uh, neuroscientist at the University of San Diego, uh, who told me he had been the chair of uh, President Nixon's commission to investigate uh, policy on marijuana back in 1973. I don't know if it was the National Institute of Mental Health or whatever the actual body was, but he shared with me that their recommendations at the time to decriminalize and I think maybe legalize. I, I'm little, I, my memory is a little sketchy of that conversation. Just led to the complete suppression of that report. I don't know if Norm has a response on that. Now I had just one other quick. I'll, I'll make this quick. William Schaefer was the person who was appointed to chair that that particular commission, uh, and it shocked Nixon when the commission came in with a suggestion. They used the language decriminalization. If you read the report, it meant legalization and regulation. Uh, and when that report hit Nixon's desk, uh, he was incensed, and he had a private conversation with, uh, I think, Governor Schaefer, somebody help me, Maryland, Governor, I think, William Schaefer, back during that era. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. thank you so much. And, uh, and Nixon said, uh, you are toast. Uh, I, I will see to it that you have no political future, and, and, and Mr. Schaefer was, in fact, uh, politically motivated and ambitious, and um, Nixon prevailed. They, they deep six the report, and this guy got exiled. The report also recommended removing marijuana from the, the international treaties classification of the drug. Interestingly enough, back to the international question. Um, I also want to mention there's a field called social pharmacology, which you, there's actually professorships in this field. Going back to the previous doctor's question, looking at the role of social factors in drug use, and the, the study on addicts from Vietnam was done at the University of Washington in the School of Social Work. Uh, your, your question. Yeah, more of a comment than oh, a yeah, question. question. Oh, you, I'm sorry. Did, did you have a yeah, question? I just had one other question, which goes to Afghanistan and um, the opium crop. And, and, and perhaps Dr. McCoy has already answered this uh, partly, but is there any rationale, I'm not saying this is really possible given uh, current uh, U.S. policy, to literally buy up the crop and use it for a global, even if, you know, it's, it's ultimately destroyed? because of the price structure of the economics, you just buy up the crop and uh, use it as a, a, a global suppository for anti-pain medication. Clearly, or it seems to be clear to me, that would be far cheaper than what we're spending in Afghanistan. And I just wonder your thoughts on that. Sure, this, that's known as the preemptive purchase policy option. And it came seriously before the U.S. government through, you know, uh, <clears throat> in the late 1970s under President Carter, at a time when Malthea Falco was the, I think, Assistant Secretary of State for Narcotics Matters, and may have been the first to hold that position. She's a very smart New York attorney, an extraordinarily intelligent person from everything I've read that she said. And she pointed out quite logically that what you'd be doing is you'd be inserting an increased demand within the illicit market. So if, let's say, this year's demand for, this year's illicit drug production was X, the U.S. government purchased X, next year's production would be 2X. In other words, that the illicit market without any restraint would expand to meet both the U.S. Uh, procurement and the illicit demand as well. So in other words, it would be a, a stimulus factor. And at that point, the, yeah, not everything that you know, what we've seen about the way that the illicit market operates, I'd have to say that that would be the the, the net result, it would incentivize to increase production. Okay. And not, not, and not, do, not have the desired effect. You see, the, 
as long as there's as long as it's prohibited and as long as there is the illicit demand there is no way of breaking the inexorable economic law of supply and demand okay you can you and that's been one of the whole problems with drug prohibition strategy i've published elsewhere and if you write me i'll send you the article uh, that in fact one of the reasons that the drug war it, it, it has failed is not simply that it doesn't accomplish objectives that drug prohibition, I argue, is in fact a stimulus. The reason we've gone from 1,200 tons of illicit opium in 1971 to approximately 8,000 tons a day is, not, is, is, is the drug war. That, that okay, uh, let's say, okay, in Colombia right now, we have, as a part of our program, uh, we fumigate, we spray with light aircraft the production. What we ignore is, in fact, the poor peasant farmer has, like all farmers, borrowed money ultimately from brokers or the cartels directly. And they have to deliver the drug in order to liquidate that loan and make the profit to keep their family alive. When, they, when, the, when we sweep in and spray that, what does that farmer do? Tell the cartel, sorry about that. No, he's got to double down. Next year, he's got to plant twice as much to meet last year's loan and to liquidate this year's loan. So, uh, uh, moreover, if you go in and you actually wipe out a region, okay, if you reduce economics 101, if you reduce supply, demand is constant, what happens? Price goes up, and somewhere in the global arena, farmers will respond to that stimulus and increase their production. So at a micro level and at a macro level, drug prohibition is not only irrational, it's self-defeating. Thank and, you, and, Professor you know, that, that People don't recognize that. It, it, a massive international policy rests upon a fundamental misperception of the laws of economics, and nobody talks about that. Thank you for talking about it. No, Carl, go ahead. Yeah, I, but I think the thing is that actually it's working quite well. It's really, I think, designed to do that, if you think about it, because on the one hand, right, and it was actually when Nixon talked about this, he specific, there's a quote, I don't remember the exact quote, but there's a quote about how he talked about the drug war, war can be used as a tool of repression, particularly against black people who are in a very quiescent state and rising up against the way things are. So on the one hand, we can continue the drugs coming in, and it was funneled into the, into the cities. And I mean, I think, Alfred, you've written books on this, right? On the, the whole history of the, even the US military involvement in terms of funneling drugs out of Southeast Asia. There's, there's a lot of exposure of the role of the US military in terms of bringing cocaine into this country. These things are established. So on the one hand, the drug war is a way for drugs to continue to be used to pacify and to keep people doped up. On the other, they're a great tool of repression, right? All these people are locked up. One in nine black people in this country are locked up. I think we gotta really look at the underlying system that's causing and fueling this whole thing. And I mean, frankly, to talk about regulating this or taking it even away from these evil drug gangs in Mexico and so forth, and then put it in the hands of what? The people who, I mean, talk about evil, corrupt people. I mean, these people, we just had a presentation of who's the biggest arms dealer in the world? The United States of America. So we want to take it away from the drug cartels and put it in the hands of the, the most evil, corrupt regime in the face of the planet? One quick point. I think also I want to echo this point about the cynicism of Norm Stamper standing up here, who, I, being from Seattle, I need to point out I was on the streets when you were, your police were un, un, unleashed against us and gassing us and firing rubber bullets at us around the WTO. So I find it kind of hypocritical that you're up here talking about what good this is going to do for humanity. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, first, a general comment. I want to thank you for your comment about the lack of the health care provider at the decision making tables when these policies are being debated and Speak a little closer to the when mic. they're being debated and put into place. But I also think there's a dual responsibility there. Us as health care providers have to make ourselves available and we have to voice ourselves. Not only should they seek us out, we need to present ourselves to them. The other thing is when all three of you spoke, you mentioned some indirectly and some directly the human cost of this, whether it was the 10% on the murder victims, whether it was the human trafficking. And you also mentioned that if you take away the prohibition and you take away that fun for the cartels or for the organized crime, well, your organized crime is weapons, drugs, and humans. And you said they're going to replace it with something else. Well, if we just do the one-pronged attack of prohibition, what happens with human trafficking and arms to replace that? 
Are you, or do you have a concern that we'll have more unintended consequences on that end, especially like for Juarez? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, I agreed with much of the previous comments about, you know, the United States is the biggest seller of arms and so on and so forth, and are we going to trust the U.S. and the people that are sending these arms? But we don't want to romanticize drug cartels either and say they're the good guys. And if they don't have drug profits, they will maximize human smuggling, prostitution, piracy, and kidnapping, extortion, et cetera. So these are very complicated problems, and we don't have magic bullets, and we can't foresee the future. But I do think in the short term, legalization of marijuana would help on many fronts, but we do have a problem of cartels unleashed on the Mexican population, the country, and there's not a clear strategy to resolve that yet. Looks like we're coming close to the end. It's 12.32 by my clock, and I just wanted to ask, uh, Dr. Stamper, if you wanted to respond to the uh, previous questioner's comment about the uh, WTO protests uh, um, repression. Not really. Uh, I screwed up. I apologize. Uh, I thought we were ready. I thought we were prepared. We were not. Uh, we made some pretty significant mistakes. Uh, I agonize over those mistakes. Uh, it's not pleasant to have your legacy after 34 years in the business to be reduced to a week but it was a very, very bad week. Uh, and some serious mistakes, I, I hate the term, mistakes were made. <laughs> I made mistakes. Uh, and the biggest one was using chemical agents on nonviolent demonstrators on day two of that week. For five years, I, after my retirement and on book tour, I was clinging to the notion that we had no option, we had no choice, uh, for a variety of reasons it take too long to get into. Uh, uh, five years into my retirement, five years ago, I concluded that that was a huge mistake and the cop in me supported it. The police chief in me should have vetoed it. So I will take that regret to the grave. I think we have time for these last two questions, if they keep them short. Go ahead, Dr. DeCaro. Thanks very much. Um, uh, Tim DeCaro from uh, Simon Fraser University in uh, New Amsterdam, uh, uh, Vancouver. Um, I was very interested in uh, the economic uh, analyses that uh, all of the speakers gave. Um, it's obviously at the base of, um, of this problem. And I was struck, uh, Norm, by your comment about Big Pharma. Uh, whenever I hear that word as a physician, I get really kind of scared because of the power of that industry. And I'm wondering if you could unpack a little bit the, uh, the comment about Big Pharma. I don't think it's all about... Uh, naloxone and Narcan and those things, there must be something else there. Well, very simply, uh, in any conversation about who might oppose drug policy reform, big pharma comes up all the time, as well it would. If it sees the potential for uh, a reduction in its profits, and I'm talking now about uh, some monolithic big pharma, uh, it's reasonable to expect opposition. That's the only context in which I, I offered that. I, I would say that uh, in, in looking at all potential forces of opposition to drug policy reform, um, there are current industries that under a regulatory system could in fact bid for licenses and participate in that process. So uh, not necessarily would they, would they be hurt. In fact, given what we've experienced with the insurance industry, Despite whatever efforts we make at reform, it seem, they, these certain industries seem remarkably resistant to efforts to reduce their profits. The Partnership for Drug Free America, which generates the idea of good drugs versus bad drugs, is heavily funded by Johnson & Johnson and numerous other pharmaceutical interests. You can look at their uh, marketing stats. Okay, keep it very brief, please. Uh, uh Thanks for squeezing me in. Uh, one thing I was struck by during the question and answer session was the way soldiers returning from more traditional wars have kind of fed drug demand. And I was wondering if um, kind of looking forwards to soldiers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, if uh, the panelists have any kind of ideas of what's coming up. Um, the circumstances are very different. Uh, Post-Vietnam, as Norm mentioned, we had enormous or problem, sorry, the, the, the demobilization from Vietnam presented an enormous problem for the United States. 
because there was very widespread heroin addiction in Vietnam. A White House survey determined 34% of all troops in country were major users of drugs. Uh, and that's where we got the, uh, uh, the urinalysis testing. That was a Defense Department contract that uh, developed that. And those of you who may have uh, had a urine test uh, to be on your high school chess team uh, have that to owe to the Vietnam War. Uh, uh, but that was, a, that was a conscript army in the midst of a, uh, the final phase of a very demoralizing war. We now have a professional army okay, that, is, um, uh, that is returning to military control so far unlike, let's say, the Soviet army in Afghanistan, which had a tremendous drug addiction problem post-Afghanistan. Post we haven't seen that so far. All right? And the, I think for all kinds of reasons, there are going to be stressors, enormous stressors that we've seen on our troops because they're professionalized. But one of them will not be, I think, significant uh, abuse of, of heroin in country and outside. Moreover, the conditions of combat in the period in Vietnam in which the soldiers used drugs, they were basically pulled back to a defensive position. All right? Now we've got small units operating in areas where they're outnumbered by the insurgents. Every barrel, every round counts. These guys don't have the liberty of, not, uh, 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 of, of taking drugs. Whereas in Vietnam, in that particular period, because we were in a defensive posture, they could. So it's a very different circumstance. Is an organization of veterans for medical marijuana, which is act, trying to sort of allow veterans to use that botanical alternative treatment for PTSD. There's cannabinoid receptors in the part of the brain that help you to forget aversive memories. And there's a lot of interest in, uh, I've met grassroots activists trying to get, use that claim, you know, to get people off of the uh, other drugs. But uh, unfortunately, we have to end. Um, thank you all for coming. Dr. McCoy will be uh, the Gloyd speaker this evening, so you can hear him more talk about uh, his work on torture. But you can see this is the roots of where his work began. So um, have a nice rest of your conference, and uh, see, you, see you around.